students in this second video um, on the spinal cord i will tell you about the formation of a typical spinal nerve and also will explain you why the nerve plexus are formed okay now let us move to the next slide where i will tell you about the formation of the typical spinal nerve let us see about the spinal nerves belongs to the peripheral nervous system as you know that the nervous system is divided into two that is the central nervous system which means the brain and spinal cord and peripheral nervous system means all the nerves which takes origin from the brain which are called as the cranial nerve and the nerves taking origin from the spinal cord they are called as the spinal nerve so both the uh, cranial nerves and the spinal nerves they are part of the peripheral nervous system there are 31 pairs of the spinal nerves means 31 on the right side and 31 they take origin onto the left side which are attached to the spinal cord and they are eight cervical though there are seven cervical vertebrae but the spinal nerves are eight okay so there are eight cervical spinal nerves 12 thoracic spinal nerves five lumbar five sacral and one coccygeal spinal nerve is there that makes total 31 spinal nerves and these spinal nerves they are attached to the spinal cord and they carry the impulse between spinal cord and various parts of the body that means this spinal nerve they extend from the spinal cord to that of the peripheral part of the body to the skin to the muscles okay so these are the spinal nerves which are connecting the parts of the body to the central nervous system through the spinal cord okay through the spinal cord now this spinal nerves they carry both motor and sensory impulse as i will tell you after few slides okay how this motor and sensory impulse are carried by the spinal nerves okay and from spinal nerves to the spinal cord from spinal cord to the brain these are the uh, impulses are going both sensory and motor impulses are going now spinal nerves from t to t12 that are called as intercostal nerve of course t1 is also called as intercostal nerve but these nerve between t2 to t12 of course t12 is also called as subcostal not the intercostal but for ease of understanding remember that t2 to t12 t12 which are intercostal are classified as typical spinal nerve okay why they are called as typical spinal nerve because they don't take part in the formation of the nerve plexus what does it mean it means that all other nerves that means from c1 to t1 that is all cervical 8 and first thoracic they are involved in the formation of the nerve plexus which is called as cervical plexus or the brachial plexus similarly that is from l2 to that of the sacral last segment as four they are also involved in formation of the nerve plexus which is called as lumbosacral nerve plexus okay okay so these are the nerve segments i mean say spinal cord segments which gives origin to the spinal nerve which are involved in formation of the nerve plexus okay so uh, while the T2 to the L, uh, T12 spinal nerves, they are not involved in the formation. We will, uh, I mean, say, understand why there is a formation of the nerve plexus in the sacral, I mean, say, lumbosacral region and in cervical region. Why it is not there in the thoracic region. So, I was telling you that from T2 to T12, the nerves which are there they are called a typical spinal nerve okay 
So first I will tell you what is the structure of a typical spinal nerve and what are its parts. So these slides will tell you about the parts of the typical. This as well as the next slide will include the parts of the spinal nerve. If we see the parts of the spinal nerve here in this diagram, see this is the transverse section of the spinal uh, nerve <coughs> cord. And this is the anterior gray horn or the anterior gray column. This is the posterior gray column. Central canal is in center. Okay. So this is except is the gray matter. Surrounding to is the white matter. What we have learned in our last video. Okay. Now the spinal now takes origin or it's arising from the spinal cord with the help of the roots and these roots are called as ventral where I am just focusing this pointer here this is the ventral root because it takes origin from the anterolateral sulcus as we have learned in the last video okay this is the median fissure anteromedian fissure and here lies the anterolateral sulcus on the whole see this anterolateral sulcus from where the various rootlets are taking origin which ultimately form the ventral root okay so this is the ventral root when similarly from the posterolateral sulcus uh, rootlets which are arising they ultimately form the dorsal roots thus spinal now is attached to the spinal cord hmm, with the help of the two roots ventral and dorsal roots okay okay now this ventral root which takes origin from anterolateral sulcus or ventral aspect of the spinal cord okay it contains the bundle of the motor fibers and to motor fiber we also called efferent fibers because these fibers they are the axons of the neuron which are going outside the central nervous system that is outside the spinal cord okay and as I said that they arise from the motor neurons which are located in the anterior horn, gray horn, okay, anterior gray column also here. Now the dorsal root here, it is the bundles of the nerve fibers, okay, which are known as afferent or sensory fibers. That means they are bringing the sensation from peripheral part of the body tissue, skin, towards the spinal cord okay and their neuron is located outside the central nervous system that means outside the spinal cord in this ganglion and each dorsal root contain a ganglion called as the spinal ganglion or dorsal root ganglion spinal or dorsal this collection of thousands of the neurons okay in this small ganglion and they are sending their peripheral process to the various parts of the body to the skin to the muscle to the joint from where they are collecting the in the sensory impulse and then this with the help of their peripheral process okay these impulses are brought to that of the dorsal gray column okay which is nothing but contains the mm, sensory neurons okay sensory neurons as we have learned in the last video okay last video so this is the first part in the formation of the spinal nerve that means roots and there are two roots ventral and dorsal root i hope that this is clear ventral and dorsal root next go to the next slide where we will see the other parts of the spinal nerve now second part of the spinal nerve is that where the ventral and dorsal root they meet each other and they form what is called as the trunk so not just like the plant where the roots are there in the soil and then stems comes out and then the branches will come out in the similar way this is called as the trunk or the stem okay so this is the trunk of the spinal 
now where ventral and dorsal roots they meet and what were the fibers in the ventral root were motor fibers and in dorsal roots were the sensory fibers that means here the ventral i mean say dors uh, the sensory and motor fibers both are there uh, in the trunk both are collected inside the trunk okay so after the trunk then this trunk uh, it comes out through the intervertebral foramina that means the spinal cord and roots they lie within the vertebral canal and then this trunk lies at the intervertebral foramina from where it comes out through intervertebral foramina outside the vertebral canal and then immediately outside the intervertebral foramina it divides into two branches so third step in the formation of the spinal now is the branch so first was root second was the trunk small trunk and third are these branches and these branches are called as rami okay they are called plural is rami ramus is a singular so there is a dorsal ramus okay and there is a ventral ramus the ventral ramus will go towards the lateral and anterior aspect of the body okay while the dorsal ramus will go posteriorly okay it will go towards the back side okay it was back so there are two rami ventral and dorsal rami when we just see about the ventral ramus it has both the type of fibers within it the which fibers motor as well as sensory fibers and they are innervating that means the branches from this ventral ramus is innervating into the lateral side of the body and to the ventral or anterior aspect of the body okay so they are uh, supplying to the anterior and lateral regions of the body but in cervical and lumbosacral region okay this ventral rami are not just similar to that of the intercostal we are discussing intercostal first okay which are called as typical spinal now so this ventral ramus okay or ventral rami adjacent rami they don't involve in formation of the plexus where from t2 to t12 in the intercostal nerve okay they are responsible to supply the muscles which are present in the single intercostal i mean say intercostal segment okay or hmm, within the muscles which are intercostal muscle present between the adjacent ribs okay okay intercostal segment so they will supply only to the muscles okay they are only so they are not involved in formation okay because in the thoracic region body is perfectly segmented so each segment of the body has its own nerve and its own nerve means the ventral ramus and dorsal ramus okay but we will see just in the formation of the plexus this is not the case okay where ventral rami will not behave like that as it is behaving in a typical spinal nerve or in the nerve which are present in the intercostal spaces okay from t2 to t12 okay t2 to t12 now the dorsal ramus okay this dorsal ramus which is shorter than ventral and goes immediately posterior medial and lateral branches are given by the dorsal rami also they are responsible to supply the skin and muscles which are present on the back side or dorsal aspect and you should remember that these dorsal rami they are ramus okay singular is ramus these this dorsal rami okay they are not responsible for formation of the plexus they are not and this i will also tell you when i will explain you about the formation of the brachial plexus okay why they are not forming the i mean say not a plexus all other plexus not only brachial when i will tell you about the formation of plexus i will give you the reason why dorsal rami are not responsible for 
formation of the plux or they don't take part in formation of the brachial plexus let us move to the next slide and now after you have learned that the how the typical spinal nerve on right and left side they are forming okay the formation we have completed that is root trunk and then dorsal and ventral rami now come uh, we come to the deeper aspect of this what are the fibers which are present in the roots into the ramus and uh, into the dorsal and ventral ramus and where they are supplying both on right side as well as on to the left side what are the different kind of the fibers which are present what kind of sensation and what kind of motor impulses they are carried from central nervous system to periphery or from periphery to the central nervous system so there are in the spinal nerve we are talking of the spinal nerve in a typical spinal nerve there are the presence not only on typical but all other spine the whole spinal nerve hmm? there is the presence of the two kind of the hmm, uh, fibers hmm? nerve fibers hmm, are present one category of the nerve fiber is somatic nerve fibers and another category is visceral what is a somatic nerve fiber a somatic nerve fibers are those nerve fibers which supply to the body wall and to the limbs or soma means body so they are somatic okay on other hand the visceral means those hmm, nerve fibers which will innervate the viscera which are deeply located okay say for example heart lung intestine stomach liver okay kidney bladder uterus all those which are viscera they are supplied not only viscera but also the glands which are there in our body they are supplied by the visceral fibers and on other hand the somatic means it will supply to the skin it will supply to the skeletal muscles of the trunk skeletal muscles of the limb the joint the capsule the tendons all other things they are somatic but viscera glands and blood vessels they are classified as viscera which are supplied by the visceral fibers now you have once understood what is somatic and what is visceral and then we will see that these fibers which are somatic and visceral they are further classified into two categories one is the visceral i mean say one is the afferent and efferent it is present in both visceral as well as in somatic let us understand what is efferent and what is afferent efferent means motor that means their stimulation will lead to the contraction of the muscle so it is somatic efferent as well as visceral efferent visceral efferent means their stimulation will lead to the contraction of the smooth muscle and secretion from the glands and contraction or relaxation of the blood vessels that is the visceral efferent so the motor activity in relation to a viscera either due to contraction of a smooth muscle or by secretion of a gland okay is ultimately the visceral efferent similarly the somatic efferent means it is the motor to the skeletal muscle its stimulation will lead to the contraction of the skeletal muscle okay thus it will move the joint okay it will move the part of the body at particular joint so the movements will be possible because of the somatic efferent fibers or motor fibers now in this diagram i have tried to show you okay all these diagrams are from my books on neuroanatomy okay published by the walter skluer the, the neuroanatomy for medical students right so i am thankful to them for using these diagrams okay let us see this diagram okay this diagram on this side this half of the spinal cord and the nerves okay taking origin from spinal cord this is the other half okay other side but you don't remember i mean say be under impression that on one side it is somatic uh, fibers on other sides 
it is the visceral fibers they are present both on both the side that means this side will not only contain somatic afferent and efferent it will also contain the visceral afferent and efferent so it's true on this side also so don't be under impression though just for simplicity okay i have drawn on one side somatic and on other side the visceral fibers let us see here now this is the ventral root okay of the spinal nerve this is the dorsal root this is the trunk and this one is the ventral ramus and this was the dorsal ramus will go on the back side ventral ramus will come on anterior and lateral side now the ventral ramus on say ventral root of the somatic it contained the efferent fiber somatic efferent which takes origin from the neuron anterior horn cells and then they go and innervate to the muscle they may go to the dorsal ramus as well as they are going to the ventral ramus and innervating to the through the dorsal ramus they will innervate the muscles of the back side and through the ventral ramus they will innervate the muscles on to the lateral and that is on to the anterior side and if it is a typical spinal nerve of the i mean say intercostal space from t2 to the l t12 then this will innervate the muscles intercostal muscles of that particular segment that means the a particular a uh, segment of the spinal cord which will innervate to the muscle that is the myotome okay um, so that portion is myotome innervated by a ventral rami of the spinal segment okay that means in the ventral rami all the efferent efferent fibers are motor fibers which are going they constitute okay uh, a segment of the spinal cord and this segment of the spinal cord which will innervate to the muscles hmm, they muscles belong to that myotomic segment which i will explain further in embryological development of this muscle after two slides okay after two slides so this is the ventral rami okay going to the muscle are the somatic efferent okay so see that this uh, somatic efferent will go also on to the dorsal side although i have not shown it here for simplicity it will go to the dorsal as well as the ventral ramus okay because here in the trunk okay of the spinal nerve both visceral i am sorry not visceral the somatic efferent and somatic afferent that is the motor and sensory are there see here in the dorsal root this is the dorsal root ganglion where thousands of the neurons are present at each spinal segmental level okay in each dorsal root and it has a peripheral process which is bringing the senses and here the impulse were going towards the muscle outside the spinal cord Mm, and right up to here the impulse will generate in the skin in muscle in the joint capsules okay so in the somatic body wall the this impulse will an impulse in the skin are pain touch and temperature mostly from the muscle joint and tendon they are uh, the proprioceptive senses and stretch and the i mean to say uh, all kind of the tensile uh, this means muscular Uh, tension okay vibration all these kind of sensation are brought from here and these fibers they are the peripheral process which are bringing these impulses okay of the dorsal root neuron okay which are present in dorsal root ganglion and, and its central process will go and end into the dorsal gray horn which is a sensory gray column or gray horn so this is how the somatic efferent and afferent nerve fibers are present in a typical spinal nerve and all other spinal nerve from c1 to the coccygeus okay c1 to the at the same time this will also contain second category of fiber what is called as the visceral afferent and the visceral efferent fibers visceral afferent and visceral efferent fibers here you will see that hmm, the visceral afferent and visceral efferent fibers they are uh, having in the again in the ventral rami 
okay or ventral root ventral root and then into the trunk and then the ventral and dorsal rami these fibers they will arise from the lateral gray horn or lateral gray column where preganglionic sympathetic neurons are located from t1 to l2 spinal segment there is no lateral horn above the t1 and there is only one lateral horn i mean say portion of lateral horn is between s2 to s4 is sacral second to 4 otherwise from below the l2 that means l3 l4 l5 s1 there is no lateral horn so the autonomic neurons are the this uh, visceral neurons they are not they are located here only in the two positions of a spinal cord t1 to l2 and s2 s3 and s4 and these neuron they are shorter than i mean say smaller than these are the motor neurons but they are also motor neuron preganglionic sympathetic neurons are motor and they send the motor fibers that means efferent visceral efferent fibers which will come from the after crossing to the ventral ramus it will jump on to the sympathetic chain where there are the postganglionic fibers present and these postganglionic fibers okay uh, i mean say neurons are present postganglionic sympathetic will give a origin to the axon which i have shown you here in dotted line will go to the smooth muscle of the viscera they will go to the glands of the viscera and an isolated gland and then they will also go to the blood uh, blood vessels okay and they mostly through the tunica media of the blood vessels so these are the structures supplied by the mm, motor fibers or efferent visceral fibers and its stimulation will lead to the secretion from gland or the contraction of the smooth muscle of the viscera it may be intestine it may be uterus it may be bladder okay it ureter okay a gall bladder or any any other viscera okay muscles so this and the blood vessels okay the blood vessel may constrict or it may relax depending on the what kind of the mm, neurotransmitter is produced at the terminal end the second half of the visceral afferent and again the this peripheral fibers they bring the sensory impulse that is the visceral sensory impulse from the gland from the smooth muscle from the blood vessels and this blue line is bringing that impulse it will come from dorsal as well as ventral ramus it is shown only into the ventral rami Hmm? a ventral ramus but not into the dorsal but imagine that it is coming from the trunk it this sensory fiber will separate out so into the posterior root it is only sensory fiber in anterior root it is only motor visceral fiber similar to that of the somatic fiber and its cell body of neuron is located into the ganglion dorsal root ganglion similar to the somatic Hmm, our friend and the peripheral process will go and will end into the gray horn of the dorsal column okay of the spinal cord or it may directly end on to the neuron okay here into the um, neuron that is the again same preganglionic sympathetic neuron preganglionic sympathetic not to the anterior gray column neuron here okay so this is how the different types of fibers are present in the spinal nerve so this is how the spinal nerve is formed and how the hmm, oh, what are the fibers which are present into this okay very quickly i will tell you uh, and that will give you fairly a good idea about how this spinal nerves they work okay now the spinal uh, nerves and the spinal cord it may work at two different level that means nervous system can work at two different level hmm, spinal level one at the local level within that segment of the spinal cord and another that the sensation will go to up to the brain and the brain will give order through the spinal cord and the action will take place in the first what is called as the reflex action or local action in the same spinal segment okay suppose this is the skin and if there is a pin prick here so the sensation of pain will go 
through this ventral ramus here or dorsal ramus it will come okay and then this is brought by the peripheral process of the sensory neuron which will bring this to that of the dorsal uh, greyhound where sensory neurons are located of both type visceral as well as somatic so it is somatic because it is coming from skin and then at this level for the reflex arc the other neurons which are present uh, neurons which are present here in dorsal horn they will directly communicate to that of the motor neurons of the same segmental level of the spinal cord and then this will generate an impulse and this impulse will be brought to the muscle and muscle will contract that means if there is a all of sudden there is a pin prick hmm, onto your skin or bite by an insect you immediately remove your limb okay hmm, right and this is because of contraction of the skull this is a protective phenomena which is at the local level of the spinal cord but if on other hand most of this the responses are from the central nervous system that is brain say for example if your finger is touching to that of the heat okay heat the another sensation going from that of the skin so it is somatic sensation this blue line is a peripheral process of the neuron dorsal root ganglion cell and then its central process will bring this impulse or the sensation of the burn or the sensation of pain and heat at the posterior gray column the posterior gray column neuron will just then cross axon of that second order neuron will then cross to the opposite side and it will go ascend in the spinal cord right up to the brain through the thalamus okay now just simplified uh, way is that it goes to the brain okay and brain analyze this hmm? Okay, what kind of the sensation the brain has received and then this brain after analysis will formulate or program an action and this action is communicated to the motor centers of the brain and where this motor neurons will be stimulated which will bring the motor impulse up to that level of the spinal cord in the anterior gray horn where motor neurons are located somatic motor neurons and then this uh, motor neuron will get stimulated so the impulse will generate an impulse through this red line uh, motor impulse will be brought to the muscle muscle will contract and then the finger will be removed from the source of pain and the heat okay this is the way how your brain first realize and gives an order to do the appropriate action so that hmm, your your protection is in the mind of the brain okay this is the i think i should stop it here the next part of the formation of the plexus i will take in the next small video okay because this is already of 32 minutes okay so i'm stopping here okay